Thank you very much. Um, well done to everybody who made it this far. Uh, we're in the final stretch. Um, so when I'm being very generous with myself, this is a talk about strategy and change management through the medium of big robots. Um, but actually, this is a talk about how much I like big robots with like a thing about privileged identities <laughs> on the top. So, um, oh, clicker. I'm also, this is the first day that I've used PowerPoint on my phone, so we'll see how we go, right? Um, uh, so the agenda that we're going to cover is, first of all, we're going to think about what a privileged account really is, why we should even care about that, how we secure them, the common obstacles, and then three things you can go away and do now. Um, like Gordon said, I'm a security architect at Microsoft and one of the CTO teams um, dealing with SecOps in Azure. So Azure is the Microsoft cloud. SecOps in this context then is kind of all the defenders in Sentinel. Um, as you can see from the slide deck, the opinions are all mine. This is not a Microsoft deck. Um, I've got a master's in applied cybersecurity. I really like digital forensics, so I just completed my GCFE recently. Um, I have had so many different jobs before I got here. So I did my master's when I was 40. Um, and before that, I have had an internet cafe. Uh, I worked for the Dyslexia Association. I was a teacher for a while. Uh, I worked as a web developer, like a bunch of stuff before I even got to Microsoft. I really like community things. So like, I'm a big fan of meetups. Gordon said I'm involved in some of the local community stuff, but I just think the community is really the bedrock of industry. Community is how we do peer-to-peer -peer learning. Community is how we give access to learning for the people who can't go through the traditional routes. It's how we catch people from falling through the cracks when they've been laid off or they need help in navigating their industry careers. Community is really important. We should all be investing in it more. Woo! <laughs> Um, right, back on topic, sorry. So, uh, what's a privileged account? Well, I'm going to give the engineering answer, it depends. Um, depends on who you ask, right? There is a technical answer. Local admin, of course, domain admin, exchange and SharePoint admin are all the obvious ones. Um, service accounts have various um, privileges over the operating system. Uh, database accounts and storage accounts have pretty full access to a lot of a lot of data. Um, but if you ask someone else, maybe they'll say, you know, my account is what I do to work on payroll, or it's how I upload my code to production. They don't care about the technical scope of it. I mean, why should they? Uh, it's just there to do their job. So right from the start, we can see the definition of a privileged account isn't always things like domain admin where you would be like, duh, of course that needs to be secure. Sometimes it's just like jack from accounting. And it's really important to keep that in mind. So right from the start, I'm trying to make this point that this isn't all just about the deep technical weeds of, you know, how to secure admin accounts. This is about how to make them secure for the business and for the staff. Because it's going to cause some disruption if you roll this out as a project. And you're going to have to convince folks upstream and leadership and downstream at the coal phase that it's worth their time. So let's take a minute to think about where we came from a little bit. So a lot of us started out on things like the Spectrum or the Amiga or the Amstrad. You just plugged them in at the wall. Sometimes you needed a boot disk. Accounts weren't really a big deal. Um, maybe you moved to a Mac or a PC then and they had rudimentary user accounts. Um, Multiple users were a little bit unstable for home users for a while, and pretty much everything you did was root or admin. Uh, maybe you were in business or academia, and normal accounts there have even more restricted privileges, so maybe you can't use the USB ports or you can't install your own software, and that's pretty normal, but the IT team can come along and install software and do things, uh, so they have privileged accounts, right? Um, and now, of course, we're all very used to this idea that our accounts are roaming. We can log in from multiple devices um, because all of our account settings and privileges are stored somewhere else. And of course, that brings its own problems because that takes the focus back off what we're authorized to do and back onto authentication. How can we prove we really are who we say we are? So the point of having user accounts is to determine essentially these two things. Authentication, when you put in your credentials, are you really you? And the second one, authorization, okay, you are. What are you specifically allowed to do in this system? 
And then because those things generate like, nice data, we also get a freebie, which is auditing. So the answer to our original question of what is a privileged account is basically just an account that can do more stuff. It doesn't have to be official. Um, because from an attacker perspective, even those less um, technically privileged accounts can still, if they get in unexpectedly, can do more, way more damage. Attackers with privileged access have control of everything, basically. And they can leak data, they can disrupt services, and they can damage property. So why should you care? Well, honestly, if you've got to this stage, <laughs> um, I mean, this is the obligatory security industry slide that says, look, there's been a lot of breaches. They were mostly from credential stealing. Small businesses get hit too. And of course, there's a lot of fines, both you know, in regulated industries and because we're in Europe and GDPR applies. Um, I don't think you'd have got to this stage in the day and remained unconvinced that, you know, security is important. Um, what strikes me, though, is these are really big numbers. Like, they're silly big. You can't hardly even conceptualize them. And especially that one, 4,000 password attacks per second. I was standing on a stage like 18 months ago saying to everyone, 600 password attacks per second. Per second. And it was a big number to me then. It's just getting worse. Um, and of interest to me then is the, so the Microsoft Compromise Recovery Team showed, uh, had a report last year, I want to say, maybe a little bit before that, that all the customers in that year that we performed compromise recovery for, 98% of them had provisioned excessive admin credentials. Um, and 92% had no MFA on those admins. So in some ways, it's not shocking that we're seeing these numbers. But we got to ask ourselves, why does Jack in payroll care? I mean, he doesn't. All that security stuff is someone else's problem. And Anna, well, she just wants to deploy her code quickly the way she always has. And actually, she's pretty narked that she's been told she's going to have her admin privileges reduced. And she's already overworked. So she's probably going to throw a load of spanners in the works when you try to run this process. And Brad, the vice president, well, he wonders why he should give up his admin creds when he's one of the most important people in the company. So that's what we're about here. It's a strategy about how you can secure these privileged accounts despite the kind of resistance you might come across. That's essentially a change management program problem because I've seen time and time again from customers that Actually, a lot of the time, there's great stuff online. They're perfectly able to turn on the technical bits and bobs. But if you haven't done the organizational preparation, and if you don't follow through on that, uh, it's not going to stick. And this is, this is where my mech analogy comes in, or falls flat on its face. I'll let you decide. So the solution is giant robot admins. Um, so, okay, technically a mech is not a robot. It's a, a robotic suit that a human can get in and pilot from within. Um, and I like to think of the privileged accounts across the org as being a fleet of mech suits with all different types of abilities and designs. And they're all also varying degrees of powerful and destructive. So they're only meant for doing admin tasks, but they could wreak havoc if they were misused. And so you only want your human pilots to jump into them if you've checked that they are who they say they are, really. Like, they haven't just carded in with someone else's ID. You want to check they're authorized to be there. Of course, you want them to be trained to use them safely. And you want to give them just-in-time access. So just-in-time is when you don't have permanent permissions to do the thing, you've got to go and request that your privileges are elevated just before you need to use it. And also time-limited, right? So you only need it for a short time. Maybe you choose to ask people for a justification when they request access to your big Mac admins. If it's a Im particularly important rule, maybe you also want to get an approver to, to double-check that. And of course, you want to be able to revoke access when that's appropriate. And, you know, you want some kind of a black box recorder so that 
when things happen, you can go and look at exactly what they did while they were in there. And all of these things are commonly controlled across I mean, all the clouds with identity and access management policies. So I can speak for Azure that, for example, you can use privileged identity management and conditional access policies to control and automate all of these things. I'm not an expert in GCP or AWS. I'm sure they have similar things. And hopefully, also, it's obvious that uh, for things like service accounts, where a human isn't using it, you can't use MFA because they don't have fingers. <laughs> but they can be secured through conditional access. PowerPoint's going okay. <laughs> um, so, I mean, uh, oh, 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 wrong side. We know that you can't go into battle without a plan. Um, and to my mind, there's four phases to securing your privileged accounts. First, you've got to clean up what's already there, and you've got to scope what policies you're going to apply. Um, then you do your te technical implementation. You've got to land the changes successfully, and then you've also got to put maintenance in place. So, uh, where are we? Laying aside the debate on whether Robocop counts as a Mac or not, uh, let's talk about the cleanup and planning. Um, security's golden rule is before you try to secure anything, you've got to enumerate what you've got. Uh, and there are tools for this. Um, so Azure has enter permissions management to help with discovering any over permissioning. And that works for users and workload identities. There's also features within PIM, Privileged Identity Management, Office 365, Admin Center, and Intune, which uh, can identify for you all the people that have admin access already. If you don't have all the fancy licensing, there's a whole bunch of publicly available PowerShell scripts um, that you can download and run. We also want to de-privilege and remove as much as possible. So... This is the bit where you tell Brad, the CEO, that he can't keep admin because he doesn't really need it. Um, and I recommend you frame that in terms of liability reduction for him. Um, and developers especially hate this part because it changes their workflow. We also want to think about separation of duties. So separation of duties isn't popular either. Uh, I frequently hear customers going, do we really? need to do that? Like, do Microsoft really do that? Yeah, you bet we do. <laughs> so the old style of doing things was to have shared accounts. Um, in fact, a few months back, I heard about a guy who started an admin job in a financial firm, and when he was given his credentials, the first thing he did was change his password. Great. Uh, and then he spent the rest of the day fielding angry questions from the rest of the team who were all sharing the same account. Um and also, like you might remember a few years back, there was a whole thing with UK MPs where one chap had been found with like porn on his machine or something. And he was like, oh, it wasn't me. It was somebody else using my account. And a whole bunch of MPs got up and said, oh, yeah, yeah, my team all do that. And yeah, it's not his fault. My team all do that too. They all share accounts. Um, <laughs> and it went around Twitter so much that the ICO started investigating. Um, so separation of accounts is not just about security. It also goes a really long way towards accountability and liability. If you can prove who did or didn't do something, then perhaps you can head off like legal or PR issues. So anyway, um, now we want to categorize what access levels we want going forward. So you should try to standardize your policies on like high, medium, and low impact admin accounts. This is a really important thing in a big organization because that way all of your different teams aren't just winging it. Whenever they need to make new decisions, there's a, a guide available. Um, and that means that you can have consistency across policies for different roles. Even if they're similar roles, it avoids arguments. It's a great idea. So um, also we find a lot that in bigger orgs, there isn't one person that knows exactly what access everybody needs. So when you come to create this central guide, you need to spend some time with lots of different teams' input to make sure that it suits everybody and that there aren't a whole heap of people who have wrong-sized access right from the beginning. So we're probably looking for separate categories for admin accounts that also maybe do some personal stuff on the system. A whole different category for admin accounts that only do admin stuff and are really, really impactful. 
uh, has a category for shared accounts. Like, if you have shared accounts and it's a legacy thing, you don't pretend they're not there. Like, at least admit you have them and put a policy around them. Maybe restrict what they're able to do outside of other stuff. Pretending they're not there, not going to work for anyone. Um, you also need to define these kind of policies for things like automated scripts and for external users. And of course, once you're putting all of these policies in place for accounts, don't forget to make a couple of break glass accounts because if it all goes wrong, you need an account that's going to be able to sign in without having to do MFA and without having all these policies. And those accounts should never be signed into. They should be heavily monitored and something should alert when someone does sign into them. It's really important from a recoverability point of view to have them there, but like we need to be careful with them. So we also want the deployment approach. Um, and the idea then is to do it in phases. First of all, obviously, do your most critical roles. Do your global admins and your privileged role ad or your role admins and your conditional access admin. Do all of those first. Then in the second phase, expand to all of your AD roles. Um, and then in phase three, expand to your resource admins. And your plan needs to also include any integrations that you've got. So if you've got third-party IDPs, Maybe you're hooking into Workday or an HR provider to help people prove who they're saying they are when they're signing in. Um, and you can govern a whole lot of other security groups and on-prem stuff from Azure AD. So you can, you can incorporate all of those things. Um, a lot of these integrations have pre-made connectors and it's just a matter of toggling a switch. But I would do want to point out as well that even if they don't, you can use logic apps and, and <coughs> workflows to operationalize those things. And that's a really good time investment for any org that if you don't understand how to make logic apps, you you can do a lot less. And if once you do, you can do it for a whole load of different things if you need to do custom stuff. Um, I'm not going to dig into this one too much. But this is just an idea of how you might do some of that categorization for your your high impact admin roles, right? So you can see there we're defining things like, you know, is MFA going to be required? Or will alerts fire? Or will a ticket be created? Um, are they always allowed to request this role? You know, or, you know, do they have to require authorization? Uh, we're, we're also using this to define like the maximum time periods for all of these things as well. So, oh, my slides are out of order. There we go. Technical implementation. There's lots of best practice guides about this, so I'm not going to go into it in depth. Um, but these are the main things, right? Shocking no one, turn on MFA for admins. <laughs> now, you can make some arguments about MFA fatigue and text-based MFA not being secure and all that jazz. But if you have no MFA that's even less secure, please just, just turn it on. It's fine. There's a really big range of options for MFA these days, and if you use single sign-on with them, it really helps to alleviate some of the burden. So single sign-on is when you successfully use MFA the first time. Um, that trusted authentication is then passed forward for new things that you go to sign into. Um, so you don't have to keep doing it over and over. Uh, there we go. Conditional access is cool. I love conditional access. So it, it's the, those things like hey, you can only get in if you're coming from a certain device. Or you can only come in if you're coming from a certain location. Or you can only get in if your client app is on the allow list. I mean, there's so many really interesting things you can restrict with. Um, and you can also say, like, you can still log in if you want, but you have got to do MFA again. Um, so that works especially for sign-ins that look a bit dodgy. And whenever you start to roll these things out, it's very stressful. You turn it on, you're worried that it's going to block a load of people's work. It's going to cause a lot of anger. Just turn it on in report mode. Turn it on in report mode. See what it reports back. You don't have to block everybody straight away. Turn it on in report mode. Clean up any errors that are occurring and then turn it on properly. Um, we also want to remove web and email access from the admin accounts as much as possible. I mean, we should be removing anything that isn't appropriate for those roles. So, like, your admin accounts shouldn't really be getting email, um, and they shouldn't really need to use the internet, or the web, at least. And we already know the two of the main ways attackers get in is 
you know, email and, oops, email and downloading bad things from the internet. So, like, just turn those off for your admins. Job's a good one. <laughs> um, if you want to delve into the details about what else you, sh- you can and should remove, uh, we have a guide called the Enterprise Access Model, and it goes into detail about some of that stuff. So you can, you can go and look at that. Um, and there's also, like, role-based controls and exchange stuff that you can restrict the exchange admin to only do exchange-related things. We should also try to be moving towards passwordless. So that makes it less painful to sign in. I mean, facial recognition, thumbprints, a PIN is is more convenient, but it's also more secure because it's tied to your device. Um, so that's FIDO keys, Windows Hello for Business, use an authenticator app. Um, and you can do that with third-party IDPs. And that way, there are no passwords stored on the system. And this passwordless idea also plays into the next point about PAWS. So a PAW is a privileged access workstation uh, that folks, especially in really high impact and critical roles, sign into to do their admin work. And it's the only place they use that admin account, and they're the only person that uses the workstation. And it's a completely clean keyboard, brand new machine, um, hardened, physically secure, And because it's not used for any other accounts, it reduces the ability to compromise the device. So, I mean, you'd be forgiven for looking at all this and thinking, that looks like a bit of a pain in the arse. If that's what you thought, do not lose that empathy, because that will help you to push this through as an organizational change. So there's another reason why I like the mech suit analogy for this, because it isn't just one and done. Running these things takes work. It takes ongoing work. You don't fix up your privileged accounts just one time and that's it. Um, And that process then needs some owners and it needs some maintenance. So your admins are going to need guidance on how and when to use their admin accounts and what they should and shouldn't do while they're in there. And depending on the size of your org, maybe this kind of mech engineering team is actually several identity teams who then need to agree their communal guidance. Or perhaps it all falls to the IT team. Or perhaps you've got your very own Mr. Scott desperately trying to hold the work core together. Um, But whatever it is, you need to understand that this maintenance tasks need some kind of regular cadence, and they need someone accountable for them. So... For my mind, the mech analogy does three things, right? It instills a sense of respect about your admin accounts. It helps to give a little bit of a good feeling about the maintenance activities because they can be a little boring. And hopefully, it also makes folks feel slightly ridiculous if they're requesting standing access to the big robots all the time. So... Let's land the changes. Um, Some teams are more affected than others. I mean, we've talked about developers already. Um, For your pilot, you should probably choose people that are pretty keen. They need to be led by a good communicator. And you really want to make the effort to spend some time enthusing them. So find an influencer. Um, So ProSci, you'll have heard of, it's a really mature change management framework, and they did a whole bunch of in-depth research about what kind of communications people wanted, and they discovered that people want to understand why the change is happening at all from the high-level managers, and from their managers there, they want to hear how they're going to be expected to change, and they want to hear that they're going to be supported through it. If you have decided to do a phase deployment for your org, Each phase usually has quite different stakeholders. So you might want to prepare different slide decks and agree on a pilot for each phase. So often the teams, because they're so different in each phase, they might need a very different communication style to really get them on board. And I know that seems really finicky, but it really pays dividends because if you carefully choose the first couple of teams you have a good influencer, you've communicated with them in the right kind of language that they respect, and it goes well, then their good deployment going well and their good feeling about it means that subsequent people to adopt the changes are happier 
and they're more, they're less likely to start creating shadow IT to get around it. And hopefully, obviously, collect feedback from the first couple of phases so that then when you iterate, you can make adjustments. So let's talk about maintenance. What do we mean by maintenance? Well, access reviews. We want to occasionally evaluate who still needs the ability to ele elevate their privileges. And so in Azure, you can automate this in the tooling, um, and you can control whether folks can review their own access and say, yeah, I still need it. Um, or you can assign reviews to a third party, like people's managers. Um, and the tool actually itself will also make suggestions based on people's usage data. Like it's going to say, I know this guy says he needs access, but he hasn't logged into it for 18 months. So hmm. um, it's not as colloquial as me, though. <laughs> Um, but look, it doesn't need to be fancy. Um, even if you don't have all of that, it's enough to just have it in somebody's calendar that pops up every three months, six months, three days, whatever suits your org. But just make sure there's a cadence in place. Um, we want to make sure that monitoring and auditing is happening. Of course, send your subscription logs to Log Analytics. Send your Azure logs to Log Analytics. You don't even have to start with Sentinel or anything. Just use Log Analytics, sign in interactive, non-interactive sign in logs, stick them on Log Analytics, and then there are workbooks to look over them, um, and Azure Monitor and things like that. Um, the main thing is, you know, be collecting the right stuff and try to collect it all in one place. Um, okay, so, oh no, that's not the right one. Oh, okay. Microsoft publishes new roles. I, it's annoying, but it does happen. Uh, so periodically we decide that there's, there's new and interesting and useful roles that you could use, or it's, we've changed some things in the back and now you can do these cool new features, but it's a new role. And so when those get published and they come to your tenant, they get assigned automatically. And that assignment might not be correct for your particular org. So whenever those new roles are published, you need somebody to go look at them and go, okay, I'm going to keep that there. I'm going to reassign it to this person. Somebody needs to make those decisions. Um, and then they need to document them. So, and you should be doing that then with reference to that guide document that you created at the start. So it shouldn't be too onerous a process. And then finally, of course, we also kind of want some triggers in place for joiners, movers, leavers, um, because those uh, affect everybody's roles. You don't want people to have remaining access when they've left the company. You want to change their access if they've moved teams. You want to give them access if they've just joined. Um, so that can be just additions to manual checklists that you maintain if you want to. Um, it could be a logic app. Um, you can use lifecycle workflows as well. That helps to automate stuff if you're using, if you're using Azure. Common obstacles that I see at customers. So, the first one is <laughs> way too common, waiting until everything is mapped out and planned. Um, people wait till they've pinned down and categorized every single last detail of every identity in their org. And in the 12 months that it takes them to do that, they have a breach. <sighs> Don't wait. Just run in phases, you know. Um, pave the cow paths. If there's stuff that people are already doing, we know we can discover that. So, like... Uh, shore up the stuff that's most important and, you know, put things in place that people are already doing. Um, so anything that's frequently used, anything critical, start with that. Uh, so I see this one happen so often it's kind of painful. Um, this is the, the, like, the three identity teams in the org just having a big argument between them about what the standards are going to be. Nobody can make a decision. Um, and the solution to that one is have a really strong sponsor. Um, have a sponsor actively engaged in the project who is going to either knock that behavior on the head or make a call. Um, and influence, and somebody who's good at influencing teams to move forward rather than just laying down the law. Another problem people do is they cut too much too soon. So once again, this is back to the set policies to report, not block at the start, just to see what happens. But also, Go easy on folks. Use the phased approach. Don't cut everything at once. You know, use phase one and don't cut everything. And then use phase two to start to reduce and take things away that you can see aren't being used. 
you do need to prepare for pushback whenever you people lose privilege um, because they're human. Um, you should be kind. You should help them understand the bigger picture rather than leaning into the just, uh, well, it's a new policy attitude because that doesn't help influence the change process. And then lastly, notifications. So your admins are going to get a lot of notifications initially. Just prepare them for it. Uh, give them extra time. Uh, it reduces after onboarding, and it, and it does improve with a little bit of tuning. So uh, things you can go do now. I know I said three at the start, but turns out it's four because I can't count. Um, <laughs> so we've already covered these, but go and turn on MFA for your admin accounts. Clean up all of your legacy access and block legacy authentication. Like, so that's really old authentication that's insecure nowadays. I mean, ideally nobody in your org should be using it, but holy smokes, not your admins. And do a little bit of work or thinking around the separation of duties, not just the technical part, but helping people understand why. So some other Azure specific stuff, I guess, if you're able, Use privilege identity management, activate identity protection, consider using enter permissions management, and for regular users, you can actually delve into lifecycle management, which will help automate all of that join or move or lever stuff that's so irritating. So here's my final thought, really. Um, security as an end state doesn't really exist. It's constantly evolving. Um, and it is technical settings and permissions and suspicion and process change and monitoring and audits and all those other things layered up that are really annoying and get in the way of your day job. Um, your developers and executives like their old workflows. Your developers and executives are faster with their old workflows. So security can be a really difficult sell for them and it costs money and time, of course. And unless you do the work, it can be a tough journey with really ambiguous business outcomes. This change management part is really important. So make sure you're prioritizing reducing risk in the most impactful areas and accounts. People are human and they're forgetful and they're full of emotions and they cave under pressure and their kids are sick and they haven't slept enough. I mean, you can go a really long way to securing things just by bringing everybody along on the journey properly. So I'm going to say give them the vision of themselves in the giant mechs so that they remember to treat the admin accounts carefully. Give them the vision of the mech wrangling on the engineering floor to, so the upkeep tasks don't fall by the wayside as much and join the mech revolution. <laughs> um, so you've been lovely. This has been my ridiculous mech talk. and I've been Angie McKeown. Thank you so much.